we are thrilled that Dr. Wiley Burke has agreed to give the keynote for this conference. There's no one more appropriate to do that. I'm going to do a scandalously brief introduction of Wiley, because uh, it could go on at great length. Uh, she is professor as well as former chair of the Department of Bioethics and Humanities at the University of Washington in Seattle. She's an elected member of the Institute of Medicine. She is past president of the American Society of Human Genetics, former chair of the IOM Roundtable on the Translation of Genome-Based Research for Health. She's also founding director of the University of Washington Center for Genomics and Healthcare Equality, which is one of the centers of excellence in ELSI research and funded by the National Human Genome Research Institute. Uh, Wiley is a close colleague of tremendous insight, impeccable judgment. We all depend on her for her insights on the many debates raised by translational genomics. And it's uh, my pleasure to introduce her. Thank you very much, Susan. It's very exciting to be here at this conference. Uh, it's already been said, uh, this is an important conference because it's moving a dialogue that's been going on for 10 or 15 years on to the next step, uh, on to the next really important step. Uh, and my task, I think, is just to acknowledge, first of all, how important it is that uh, the discussion that we're going to have today, uh, and then place this discussion a little bit in context of where, where we've been in the dialogue about return of results up till now. Uh, so uh, for 10 or 15 years, uh, the research community in particular, very much the genomics research community, has been talking about this issue of returning individual results to participants. And in the course of this conversation, many arguments have come forth. Uh, many of you in the room have been responsible for developing these arguments, uh, and they include, first and foremost, a set of normative arguments that have to do with uh, having information or generating information in the research process that could provide benefits to research participants and could uh, sometimes provide beneficial information that isn't otherwise obtainable. Uh, participants, it's argued uh, by some, also have a right to this information about themselves. Uh, and there's an issue of respect and reciprocity. Individuals participate in the research to help the research go forward, they deserve this back. So uh, these are the kinds of arguments that have been made on a normative basis. And there's a practical argument. It's very clear from a whole lot of empiric data that participants are interested in getting results and that getting results back may be an incentive to participate. At the same time, this has been a dialogue, and it has included arguments against returning uh, research results to participants. Clearly, we're doing research because we need to understand questions we don't fully understand. Uh, and so a lot of the information that derives from research is still uncertain. Uh, how responsible is it to give people back that kind of information? Uh, there's a concern also about inappro inappropriate use of research resources. Resources are scarce. They should efficiently be dedicated to the production of generalizable knowledge, which is the goal of research. And, uh, and so we're talking about uh, possibly diverging, diverting both resources and effort, should we be doing that. Well, as this conversation has been going forward, uh, it, it, there's been a very interesting wrinkle in, in this back and forth, uh, which I think is really well articulated uh, some years ago by Lisa Parker, Hard to say never. In other words, if you want to make a very strong argument against using research, research resources to return results, um, you still have to consider the possibility, as she says it, that a result might sometimes meet a Tarasov-informed criteria of a duty to warn or disclose, um, perhaps even impose results on research participants, a very interesting and certainly uh, controversial claim. Um, the, the point, though, that she's making here is that research results might sometimes have a level of beneficial value to the participant that creates a different kind of obligation, at least on an ethical basis. Um, uh, she, she says, read this as reliable, 
life-saving or severe morbidity preventing information. And it's that issue of um, hard to say never that has really been the wedge, I think, that has developed uh, over time into an emerging consensus about circumstances where researchers arguably should be returning research results. Um, so uh, we see the first um, consensus statements uh, uh, emerging on this issue as early as 15 years ago in 1999. And, and the tone here, as compared to tone of later uh, statements, as I'll show you, sort of uh, paints the journey that we've been on. Um, so when the National Bioethics Advisory Committee in 1999 published a statement on this issue, um, what they were concerned about is to explain uh, circumstances where results could be returned and only should be returned under those circumstances. Um, so they were saying the findings should be valid and confirmed. Um, they should have a significant implication for the subject's health, obviously open to discussion, uh, how we define that term, and a course of action for improvement or treatment is readily available. But again, the, the emphasis was um, only then would you even think about returning. Um, an NHLBI working group in 2004 used somewhat different language, but in essence articulated uh, the same kinds of principles um, that uh, if you wanted to return results, you needed to meet certain criteria. Okay, um, and then we move forward to an ongoing discussion, and I'm uh, highlighting uh, the very important um, work uh, that Susan Wolf led um, that's already been alluded to that I think really moved the dialogue forward in a number of very important ways. Uh, the most important and, and this real change of tone that you see in this consensus statement is this notion that there are circumstances when a researcher should uh, disclose results. Uh, and uh, the, the uh, criteria that are being pulled out are not particularly different from what the National Bioethics uh, Commission had already articulated. Um, what was different here, I think, was here are some results that should be returned. Um, I, I think it's also important, and I would argue still probably under discussion, um, that this statement uh, suggests that uh, those should be disclosed when there was a strong net benefit from the participant's perspective, suggesting the key importance of participants defining when these criteria have been met. Uh, I think that's a very important issue that, that I would argue we're still talking about, which has to do with exactly how do we define these criteria and who's doing the defining. But you can see that the, the should here has to do with significant risk of life-threatening condition, could help or pre, uh, to prevent or ameliorate a grave condition, or could inform re reproductive decision-making similarly related to a grave or life-threatening condition. Um, and then the distinction here that those are the kinds of results that researchers should think about returning and or should return, and then there are going to be other results, results that have clinical and analytic validity where disclosure is acceptable, and then results where we really shouldn't think about disclosing. So I think this, this continuum of, of um, descriptors uh, sort of helps us to think about the kinds of results that might um, justify different kinds of actions, uh, including in some cases, obviously, withholding results. Uh, updated NHLBI guidelines, uh, as I read them, are strongly echoing the kinds of uh, issues that were brought forth in that consensus statement, uh, most particularly this notion that we are now talking about results that should be offered. Um, I'll, I'll just pause uh, for a moment here. I know that many in the room participated in this particular uh, set of guidelines, and we can acknowledge that in, in this consensus statement and probably in most consensus discussions about this issue, um, there do continue to be differences of opinion about when, when that actionability criterion is actually met, and in particular, uh, what the relative importance of returning uh, uh, results related to reproductive decision making versus results relating to a participant's own health care, um, how that should be considered. So it, 
uh, there, there, I want to argue that there's an emerging consensus, but within that emerging consensus, still some issues of discussion and particularly some issues of definition. But um, that consensus, I would argue, is here um, in, survey, uh, in surveys that were done uh, around the same time uh, of the second NHLBI statement. Um, both uh, uh, IRB professionals and geneticists were surveyed, and as you can see, there's very strong agreement in both groups to the notion that researchers have an ethical obligation to return individual research results that would affect a participant's health or health care. The focus in these surveys was on genetic information, but this, this particular question applied to either genetic or non-genetic information. Evidence then, I think, of, of this emerging consensus and a shift uh, from uh, a reality 10 or 15 years ago where the norm was not to return results and where people began to talk about the, uh, what criteria you would have to meet if you wanted to return results to now uh, this notion of an ethical uh, duty to return results in certain circumstances. And in the most recent uh, consensus statement on this issue, this comes from the CSER Consortium and the Emerge Consortium working together. Uh, and again, many people in this room were involved. Uh, we have an articulation that I think is a further articulation of, um, of the ideas that were first developed in the Wolf et al. statement. Uh, this is described as the floor, the ceiling, and everything in between. The floor, then, is the should. Um, results that are valid, medically important, and actionable. Um, so those are the kinds of terms around which people are, uh, are, are beginning to develop a, a, a reasonably strong consensus. And then, interestingly, uh, the note that these are results that are either discovered purposely, purposefully, that is, that's what the research was about, so that's the re uh, result we found, or by chance in the course of the data analysis. This addresses a very important point that has emerged in the process of this discussion, the notion that there is no duty to hunt. Uh, in other words, researchers generate results as part of the research process and in order to achieve the goals of research. And as a result of that, they may sometimes uh, discover results that arguably should be returned because of the kind of criteria we're talking about. They don't need to go looking elsewhere in their, uh, in their material that they've collected uh, for other results that might meet those criteria. Uh, no duty to hunt, and also uh, another important issue that has emerged in the course of this deliberation is the notion that participants may refuse results. Um, and that has behind it uh, a lot of interesting procedural uh, um, uh, question process. Um, how do you make sure that participants know that they have the right to receive results, know that they're going to have the option, but also know that they have a right to refuse? How do you do that? Um, so the floor, the ceiling, and everything in between, the ceiling in this consen consensus statement is all information that has analytic and clinic valid clinical validity. In other words, sure, as long as you, you believe this information, you can return it. Um, you do need to be careful. Um, you need to think about the risks and benefits of return, but that's what this consensus statement says. Now, um, let's step back from that and just talk about where we are in clinical care, and um, this is really for the purpose of contrasting the research situation and the clinical situation. Um, clearly, we have regulatory requirements um, that tell us that patients have access to all information in their medical records and to the laboratory results as well. Um, that and was added just uh, October 6th of this year, um, so it's a relatively new requirement. Um, and, of course, at the same time, other side of the coin, the privacy of this health information is to be strictly protected. In fact, you could say the access stems from the privacy protection in a sense, or is related to it, in this sense that um, patients have a right to know uh, what's being protected, what people have, what information people have about them. They have a right to a full understanding of that, um, and similarly a right that that information be protected. Uh, I, I think uh, it's important to note that this has also been an evolving standard. 
That is the creation of HIPAA, um, the interpretation of HIPAA, the modifications of HIPAA, uh, and clear regulations that most recently have led to the right of access to laboratory uh, results, all reflect an ongoing dialogue, an ongoing policy uh, discussion and policy development process um, to clarify exactly what it is that clinicians owe to patients. Uh, in a longer time frame, um, but a time frame that's within living memory, um, we also have seen an evolution in our thinking about truth telling. Um, so I think we can all uh, remember or have heard stories about aunts or grandmothers who had metastatic cancer but were never told what they had. Uh, and it is clear in the, uh, in the dialogue of the past three to four decades that this is increasingly viewed as unacceptable. Um, truth telling is our standard. Patients have a right to know what we know about them in the healthcare delivery system. You could say that what we're talking about here is, um, is two things. One is our sense of what it means to be uh, respectful of patients to be at their service, and also an acknowledgement that that is fundamentally what is happening in healthcare. We are at the service of our patients, and that clearly drives uh, an entirely different way of thinking about disclosure of results. Now, I want to talk about um, whole genomes in clinical practice um, because in a very interesting way, they raise some of the issues about actionability that have been so dominant in the, in the discussion about return of research results. Um, whole genomes uh, and whole exomes, uh, technologies that allow us to develop DNA sequence, vast amounts of DNA sequence, um, are becoming increasingly uh, interesting as clinical tools, as diagnostic tools for patients with uh, complex phenotypes that we suspect are genetic but can't figure out on conventional testing, uh, as a method for evaluating uh, tumors and potentially um, identifying new uh, ways to treat them, and, um, and also simply as a more efficient way to gather genetic information. The cost of an exome is more or less the same cost as a test for BRCA1 and BRCA2, and shouldn't we be using the technology that gives us more information? But as patients come into clinical care and we think about using whole genomes or exomes uh, to address the clinical question that they brought with us, we know going in that for any given clinical question, uh, we only need a small portion of the genomic information um, in order to address the clinical question. Um, so. What do we do with all that extra potential information? Um, do we, in fact, have a duty to hunt for more? Is it different in the clinical situation than in the research situation? And if so, what kind of criteria do we use? Well, actionability has been brooded about as the way we should think about this. Um, Clearly, also, we have the issue of should patients be offered choices? Um, uh, if so, what sort of choices? And clearly, we're still in discussion about that issue. I do want to uh, give you just a little bit of a picture of what I think is an emerging body of data. Uh, this is a body of data mostly to do with the views of research participants, but I believe our, uh, informs us both about how people might, view, uh, might think about receiving research results um, and, and also um, moving on to the clinical question is all, as well. So a couple of studies have been published from a focus group um, investigation uh, that included African American and non African American participants uh, talking about the possibility of receiving genomic results, um, secondary results uh, after a genome has been done, either in a research setting or a clinical setting. Uh, and you can see that a majority uh, wanted at least one secondary result. A small subset wanted, quote, everything, and everything in this particular study really was everything you could manage to get from the genome. Both groups highly valued choice. They placed a priority on results one could, quote, do something about. So there's the actionability theme emerging, although the interpretation of what you could do something about was probably much broader uh, than what we would typically put into a medically actionable 
category. Um, but there was clearly a range of feelings as well, particularly around future risk, um, the, the, the idea of information to plan versus driving yourself crazy, and some thematic differences in these particular data that I think are worth just noting, uh, because again, we're only, I think, at the beginning of understanding how uh, individuals' lived experience may influence how they uh, interact with technology. Um, so themes of distrust, uh, uh, concern about psychosocial implications and uh, hope for community benefit were present in the focus groups involving uh, African American participants and really not in, in the others. Um, there are um, clearly lots of research studies going on. Uh, many of us just attended the American Society of Human Gene uh, Genetics meeting uh, in San Diego and um, just trying to cull some of the information from many posters on this issue. Um, what I found very interesting is that even research studies studying secondary findings of genomics mostly offered a limited range they were not offering everything, meaning every possible bit of information you could get from the genome. In general, they were offering a panel of high-risk medically actionable findings, carrier states, uh, and pharmacogenomic information. In that context, the studies were fairly consistent. Somewhere around two-thirds of participants kind of wanted it all. Um, but preferences ranged pretty broadly, um, from none to all, uh, or including in between. Uh, a few studies had the capacity to assess people's preferences over time and found that it was not uncommon for people's preferences to change over time. Uh, so not only are preference settings different, but people may, um, over time, think, think differently. Um, very important for our purposes here, uh, highly variable perceptions about both actionability and the concept of severity. What that means is even what we would consider serious, we professionals who are sitting in consensus statements might not match um, with what the individuals whose information it is might view as serious. Um, and interestingly, one study did ask, uh, how interested are you in risk issues for your relatives um, as well as for yourself? And 80% of their response, very small n, uh, was uh, that interest in risk for relatives mattered. Um, so these are just snippets. They're posters. Uh, but uh, they represent, first of all, important work in pro progress that's going to help us think about these issues, but some glimmer of uh, the range of views that participants may bring to this issue. Um, I just want to note one particularly interesting finding from, um, from a poster from, from UNC, and I know there are folks here from UNC, uh, but I, I thought this was a very interesting finding that in the process of having focus groups to discuss this issue, what seemed to keep emerging was a disconnect about the idea that you could even have choices, the notion that you did a whole genome and now you're giving me choices about what I get and what I don't get. It, it didn't seem to compute, if I'm understanding there correctly. It was the, 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 the idea of running a test and then deciding what you pull from the test didn't altogether make sense. That's a pretty challenging issue for us to think about. Okay, so that's a context. That's kind of the journey we've been on, uh, particularly around returning research results, but also thinking about some of these implications for, uh, for the clinic. Um, and how do families come in? Well, I, I think Susan's already made this point. Um, families, of course, are integral to the lived experience of individuals. There's no participant or patient who's out there in isolation. Uh, we are all, all part of families, and those families take many different forms. Uh, they are constellations of biological and non-biological relatives. Sometimes the whole family's a non-biological relative, a uh, set of biological relatives, even though in genetics we tend to focus on, on the biological connections. Um, also, interestingly, uh, I, I think we could note that uh, families are health communication networks. They're often ineffectual health communication networks. And one of the things I, I think we may need to think about is how to help them be more effectual. Um, but they are a potential source and potentially crucial source of information. 
Um, and, and that relates, I think, ultimately back to the kinds of thinking we might have about duties to talk to family members. Um, they are of particular interest to genomics, but not necessarily unique to genomics. Um, that is, the kinds of shared health issues um, uh, include many things that are non-genetic or not biologically shared. I mean, the obvious is the biological connection. Um, the obvious and the place where the issue of talking to family members comes up most prominently in genetics is in families like this. Uh, a patient is deceased. Uh, you discover with results that come back after she dies that she had a BRCA1 mutation, she has a daughter, uh, she has a niece. Uh, shouldn't that daughter or niece be told? Uh, shouldn't we find a way to pass that information on? Uh, there's the obvious connect, uh, uh, question. Um, but shared risk takes many forms within families. Uh, if a 50-year-old had a heart attack and then died of his heart attack, um, we may do a lot of sorting out uh, after the fact, including at autopsy, um, to sort out what was really going on. Uh, and it might be that what was going on was genetic. And it might suggest that there are genetic tests that would benefit biological relatives. Uh, it's also possible that we're going to find out things about him um, that would be useful to, for the family to know that have no particular connection to genetics, that have to do with shared uh, lifestyle factors, for example, um, that uh, place many other family members, biologic and non-biologic, at risk. Um, and the question I think we can ask is, don't we also have the same obligation there to pass the information on? So families have interests in the health information of patients and participants. Uh, and uh, as, as I understand it at this point, and maybe I'll understand it a lot better at the end of this day, um, they have uh, interest in information about health risks to family members uh, based on what we know about the participant or the patient. Uh, they have an interest in information that assists them in their care duties. So even if, if it has no direct relationship to their risk, that information may be helpful to family members to help them function as a good family and, and good family members. Um, and also they have an interest in information that resolves uh, uh, questions that, that haven't previously been answered. Why did someone die? Sometimes that's a very important question to resolve in the family, even if it has no uh, specific consequences to family members. Obviously, what's at issue here in this conference is when, if ever, do these interests, which are very real, um, outweigh the privacy interests of participants or patients? When is the role of the researcher for example, to encourage disclosure, and when is the role of the researcher to be an agent of disclosure? I would say that as we think about these issues, there are two uh, key questions for us to consider. And one of them is to go back to that issue of actionability. I don't think we're done discussing this issue of actionability. Uh, it's clearly a potential ra rationale for disclosing information in borderline or uncertain situations. It is, it has been used as a justification to create an ethical duty where no legal duty exists in, in research and arguably to outweigh privacy interests uh, when we're talking about disclosing uh, to family members. Um, so it's a really important concept. Who defines it? On what basis did they define it? What context? matters. How do we think about this? I think there's already been a lot of good thinking about this, but I think there needs to be more. I think we're still uh, resolving this issue. And I, I would argue that the contextual issue may be mo most important. Given the context, how actionable does something need to be? Is there a range of actionability that we need to consider? Um, and I would suggest that another uh, major issue is the notion of alternative benef uh, paths to beneficial information. In other words, if a researcher has information that could potentially benefit a family member, one of the questions is very reasonable to ask is, does a family member have some other readily available path to that information, or am I the only conduit 
Um, uh, that could influence uh, how we think about uh, handling information, and I, I would argue particularly handling information of deceased participants. Uh, because if we have information about a deceased participant and no one's going to know it unless we disclose it, that may be an important consideration, again, taken in context of d our, our thinking about actionability. Um, and, and therefore may be important in defining what we would consider allowable disclosure. Clearly, there's a need for deliberation, so it's a wonderful thing that this meeting is happening. Our practice standards are still evolving. Uh, we're still developing uh, conceptual frames and justifications. The background uh, document to this meeting obviously is a major uh, step forward in that regard. Uh, and where I think we need to go next as a community uh, is to move toward clarifying our points of consensus, equally importantly clarifying areas of persistent disagreement. Um, and then as we develop that clarification, figuring out how to expand the conversation out. There are many stakeholders beyond the experts who are at this meeting uh, and, uh, and we need to figure out how to continue and broaden the conversation as we go forward. I think it's gonna be an exciting day. Glad to be part of it. Thank you. It would be great to have a couple of questions for Wiley before we transition. So, one mic is there. We're getting the other mic. Questions, comments? Yes, I'm sorry, it's hard for me to see because the light is so bright. Can we get a mic right there? Could you just introduce yourself? Hi, Laura Hemme, University of Minnesota. Um, I just have a question about actionability in the context in which oftentimes the institution that is the host for the research is also the institution that is the host for providing health care. Um, so there could potentially not be a division of financial incentive when it comes to running additional tests or pursuing outcomes, especially you know, given that procedure-driven medicine is very financially beneficial to institutions. I'm just curious about what you think about that. Yes, you're raising a very interesting issue. What, what might be the incentives independent of just providing benefit to a research participant or a family member from disclosure or disincentives? if the healthcare is going to go elsewhere, I want to raise that issue. But I think you're also getting at a, a, a very core issue that um, is worth emphasizing in this discussion as well. And that is um, how we think about the, the border uh, between research and clinical care. Uh, and particularly, as many have said, how do we think about the gray zone between uh, those two circumstances? Um, as the background document has illustrated, there may be times when research, uh, research participants do have legal right um, to their research information if a particular institution puts it into a designated record set. Um, but, um, but we should still be clear about what's happening in the research setting and what's happening in the clinical setting uh, and maybe equally clear about times when we're deliberately muddying the waters. Um, so if we do research as the clinical uh, sequencing exploratory research studies are that puts research results into the clinical record, we are deliberately moving information from one um, uh, regulatory framework into another f regulatory framework, and that too will will influence how we think about exp uh, 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 disclosing results. So I think these are very important issues. Uh, Mark Robson from New York. Um, it seems to me that one of the major tensions here that you highlighted was the issue of um, the privacy of the source of the result versus the family's interest in the result. And, and, you know, as an oncologist, I have a particular interest in the decedent question. So could you explore a little bit or share your thoughts about the differences between the privacy interests of somebody who is dead versus somebody who is alive and the ways in which those differences might influence how we think about those two different circumstances? 
Uh, so differences between the privacy interest, interests of a deceased uh, individual versus someone who, who's alive. So let me do my basic disclaimer, not a lawyer, many lawyers in the room <laughs> who I will defer to. Um, so just thinking about this in terms of uh, ethical obligations and in terms of being supportive of benefit to participants and patients, um, what we can say first of all is the person who is alive is hopefully able to express his or her wishes. Um, and we have, I think, a very serious duty uh, to respect those wishes. Um, there may be circumstances where we want to argue that there's an action to be taken that isn't consistent with those wishes, but we certainly have to think very, very seriously about doing so. So I think that's, I think the, the potential of a, a person to express their wishes is a very important component of this conversation. Clearly that extends to wishes that were expressed and documented before the individual died. Um, so we're in a very different circumstance if we have a deceased participant who um, did not express any particular uh, preference one way or another. That mom, let's say, who died and we find out afterwards that she had a BRCA1 mutation, um, I would argue that in that circumstance from an ethics perspective, there's a strong argument for passing that information on to the family so that other, other family members may benefit. I confess um, that I would find it very complicated and difficult if the mom had expressed a preference not to share results before she died. Um, and that's one of the conundrums that I hope uh, is the kind of thing that we might talk about uh, at this meeting. Now, I, I, I actually will defer to Susan here. My understanding is the HIPAA privacy protections do extend well beyond death, 50 years yes. beyond death. Um, so um, we can't say that there is, we, we have to be respectful of that reality as well. Can I just throw in one last question, and, uh, which is how do we think about, Wiley, actionability once removed? I mean, you've got a finding. Let's say it meets whatever your criteria are for actionability as to the research participant. But when you look at a family member, you're going to have to confirm whether they actually share that variant. And in the context of their age, their other health uh, data, it may or may not be actionable. Yeah, so I, I think that's obviously a key issue when we're talking about disclosure of family members. And I think there are uh, several elements I, I would propose, um, eager to have the conversation, that come into this. One of them is how likely is the family member? So if you have something that's highly actionable, like a BRCA, one mutation, and a family member who has a 50% likelihood of having inherited that mutation, that's a pretty high likelihood, so that's a factor. Um, it, it, clearly, as you say, uh, actionability is always going to be influenced by um, uh, other factors about that individual. That is, actionability is always contextual. If you have a 90-year-old who's um, got uh, congestive heart failure, it may not matter what cancer risks that individual has. Um, and uh, I think the other point about uh, this once removed situation is that a priori, um, you are weighing privacy interests and um, whatever benefits you can provide. I think uh, that in intuitively, though I'm interested in the discussion, that leads to a higher threshold, or at least to us are thinking about a higher threshold of actionability. Those would be my thoughts. <laughs>